Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, tonight, uh, this gorgeous Southern California night. My name is Peter Lunenfeld. I am the vice chair of the Department of Design Media Arts. Welcome to our EDA, uh, which is a space that we use for events like this and also for shows. Um, we actually have two, two small pieces. One was up over here by David Ertel and Simran Chawla, one of our, uh, two of our grad students. And then afterwards, if you're heading out in the graduate gallery up there, there is a show by Tuakaman Tong Barut, Tong Borosut, um, called I Celeb, which I think will fit in somehow. Um, I just really wanted to say I'm delighted to be able to uh, offer this uh, and to co-host tonight's talk with the center, uh, excuse me, for the, with a program in experimental critical theory. And I'd really like to thank Kenneth Reinhardt, the director of ECT, uh, for putting this meeting together. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Ken to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, Okay, we're full. It's being streamed, so everyone will be able to see it. Uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, this talk is sponsored by the program in Experimental Critical Theory and the Department of Design Media Arts, and I wanna thank Peter for making uh, this all possible, and especially this beautiful space. Slavoj Žižek has been visiting UCLA regularly for over 25 years now. In that time, he has emerged as a consistently penetrating analyst of contemporary culture and politics and one of the greatest critical theorists of our time. He is, as well, an extraordinarily powerful philosopher. Indeed, he is perhaps the philosopher of our time, who completely fulfills Alain Badiou's famous statement that, quote, a contemporary philosopher, for me, is indeed someone who has the unfaltering courage to traverse Lacan's anti-philosophy. Zizek's astonishingly fruitful synthesis of Hegel, Lacan, and of course Marx has opened countless paths for new possibilities of thinking and acting for today in both philosophy and anti-philosophy, which, according to Bedieu, attempts to break through the deadlocks of possibility and necessity that hobble contemporary politics with an assertion that the apparently impossible may be our only real choice. Slavoj's work has opened up so many worlds to me personally and for so many people all over the world. I can't begin to enumerate his many publications, the many books that have been devoted to him, there's a journal that's devoted to him, the many movies about him and that he's been involved with, but let me just mention a few of my favorite of his titles, um, beginning with what was just an absolutely era-defining book, in 1989, The Sublime Object of Ideology. In 1993, Tearing with the Negative. These are just personal favorites. <laughs> in 1999, no, that was 1993. 1999, The Ticklish Subject. In 2000, The Fragile Absolute. 2003, The Puppet and the Dwarf. And in 2012, the magisterial volume, Less Than Nothing. Hegel and the Shadow of Dialectical Materialism. Please join me in welcoming Slavoj Žižek. His talk today is called, Is There a Posthuman God? I just hope I like to be here, I feel at home, and like most of you, I still remember, no, like most of you don't, I still remember 20, 25 years, Westwood was much livelier. Maybe those <laughs> times will return. And I am especially grateful to Ken, and I see my other friends here. For example, you know how many ideas I also took from Ken. Kent had already, you developed this over 10 years ago, I think, this wonderful flash of an insight that what if what we call human rights are precisely the rights to violate the Ten Commandments? 
you know, like the R, the, at least for you, in the U.S., the right to have arms it means the right to kill. You know, it's no don't kill. Sexual freedom means you can... And so it's a wonderful reading. I'm also glad to see here uh, my good old friend John McCumber, who wrote uh, years ago a wonderful book in the company of words on Hegel. He, his dream, I hope, is the same as mine, the one of totally without any shame redeeming Hegel for today. I even ironically in that over 1,000 pages book called Less Than Nothing, where it certainly doesn't wait less than nothing. Uh, 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 my idea is even to perform a materialist reversal of Marx in Hegel. The crazy reading is that Hegel was more materialist than Marx. So uh, I do with all this, I'm just glad to be here. Not to lose time, since I usually talk too much, I just a word, would like to begin with a warning so that I will not uh, disappoint you. <laughs> Neither the word Trump, I will just now mention things which brought me a lot of trouble <laughs> lately. <laughs> Neither the word Donald Trump, or the words, nor the word LGBTQ plus, or however you put it now, will be pronounced here. I will not deal with that. I will do something, unfortunately, you will be bored, probably. Uh, I will precisely do an old-fashioned analysis of our present constellation, not in the United States, but general, where are we with humanity, what does this mean with religion, and then I will try to conclude with an analysis of a good Danish thriller to illustrate what would have meant to me a, a kind of a Christian atheist position, which I think is a religious position. I'm an atheist, but I define myself, it will be clear why, as a Christian atheist, uh, what this, how this would have worked. So, without further ado, let's, let's go on. Let me begin, paradoxically, by a conservative philosopher whom some people even dismissed as a half-neo-fascist, but who is a friend of mine, and I think he is interesting. I'm, of course, talking about Peter Sloterdijk, the famous author of, uh, already in the late 80s, of the Critique of Cynical Reason. I think still the achievement of that book is extraordinary, because he first deployed this basic idea that which at a different level was then deployed by my good Austrian friend. You should, I think, invite him here. He is extraordinary, Robert Faller. This idea of beliefs which socially function, even if no one believes in them. It's a wonderful idea developed also under the guise of his, uh, Faller's new term, interpassivity, how others can believe for you, how we, today's predominant ideology is cynical. We are realists, we don't care, uh, I mean, uh, we don't believe, but we, we usually project our beliefs onto others. Nobody believes, but a belief functions, like a classical, stupid, simplified example. Uh, 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 Christmas, Santa Claus. If you ask parents, do you believe in Santa Claus? Their answer would have been, of course, I'm not crazy. I buy the presents. Of course not. <laughs> yeah, but it's a problem because then you ask children, do you believe in Santa Claus? They say, of course not. I just pretend to not to disappoint my parents to get the <laughs> presents and so on. You see my point. Nobody believes in it, but it functions socially. It functions. It is operative as a belief. And I think that not only religious beliefs function like that, even our amusement, for example, and that's Fallers, Robert Fallers idea, take what is for me the greatest contribution of American culture in the 20th century to world civilization. You must know my joke. It's canned laughter on TV. Says, Are you aware what a paradoxical thing canned laughter is? You return home in the evening tired as a dog, you put you turn on the TV, you watch some stupid cheers or whatever show, and 
the TV laughs for you, literally. <laughs> it's wrong when people claim that this is some kind of Pavlovian manipulation to trigger your laughter. No, I've spoken with specialists. They are aware it doesn't function like this. It doesn't function with me, and I was told this is the norm. You look at it just like an idiot tired. At the end, you feel relaxed as if you have laughed. And you see, phenomena like this uh, interest me tremendously. If I may repeat a joke which I used in some ten of my books, but it's the best rendering of this paradox. I'm sorry if some of you know it. Uh, my favorite theoretical anecdote about Niels Bohr, you know, Copenhagen and so on, who, I'm sorry if you know the story, once he had a small country house out of Copenhagen in the countryside. At once he was visited there by a friend who saw above the entrance to uh, the door of that country house uh, a horseshoe. I don't know how you are here, but in Europe this is a superstitious item allegedly preventing evil spirits to enter the house. And the friend asked him, but why do you have that? This is superstition. Aren't, aren't you a scientist? Do you believe in it? Niels Bohr answered, I'm not stupid, I'm a, of course I don't believe it. Then the friend persisted, but why do you have it there? Ah, Niels Bohr was a reader of Kierkegaard. His answer was, of course I don't believe it, but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe it. <laughs> That's ideology today. You know, nobody believes it. We are all cynics and so on, but uh, we act as if we believe. So... Uh, uh, at this level, again, Sloterdijk followed this path. And I was pleasantly surprised by his last book, or is it still the last, I'm not sure, what happened in the 20th century, which is, interestingly enough, a direct dialogue with Alain Badiou. Okay, Sloterdijk is some kind of neo, half neoconservative, critical of Badiou. But I was surprised, if you are not deceived by appearances, how far does Sloterdijk go? So, finally, let me go into it. Uh, in his book, it's not yet translated, incidentally, unfortunately, into English. I hope it will be. It's a short book. After rejecting <coughs> the 20th century, what Badiou calls La Passion du Réel, Passion of the Real, because for Sloterdijk, this passion of the real, you know, get rid of appearances, uh, arrive at the real. Uh, for, uh, for Sloterdijk, this is a harbinger of political extremism, which leads to the ext extermination of enemies, and so on, and so on. Well, Sloterdijk, I think, is wrong here. First, if you read Badiou's book, Century, he, Badiou is well aware that passion of the real is always accompanied by a passion for semblance. This is why Badiou develops in a very nice way how the 20th century passion of the real, which effectively ended up in different totalitarianisms, gulag, and so on, uh, instead of this real of purification, let's get rid of false semblances, and so on, has to be replaced by, by, uh, by the real of subtraction. It's a totally different uh, logic. And also, Badiou is fully aware, that's clear in Badiou, Sloterdijk misses it, how uh, uh, precisely the regimes which may appear to be passion of the real at its clearest, like radical Stalinist regimes. You kill millions, you don't care about appearances. No, they do care about appearances. I don't think there ever was a regime which was so desperately clinging to appearances if there ever was a regime more like Stalinist regime. Maybe Maoist cultural revolution. They are so sensitive to every breaking rupture of appearances and so on. That's the paradox. But okay, let me go on. So, uh, Sloterdijk claims that in the 21st century, something new is happening which compels us to break with this 
procedure of passion of the real. Let's arrive at the thing itself, getting rid of all appearances and so on. And what he, Sloterdijk, sees happening is best encapsulated by the title of the first two essays in this book, What Happened in the 20th Century. The Anthropocene and, a wonderful subtitle, From the Domestication of Man to the Civilizing of Culture. Anthropocene, as we all know, designates a new epoch in the life of our planet in which we humans cannot any longer rely on the Earth as a reservoir ready to absorb the consequences of our productive activity. We cannot any longer afford to ignore the side effects, collateral damage, of our productivity. These effects cannot any longer be reduced to the background of the figure of humanity. We have to accept that we live on a, as they call it, spaceship Earth, responsible and accountable for its conditions. Earth is no longer the impenetrable background or horizon of our productive activity. It emerges as another finite object which we can inadvertently destroy or transform it to make it unlivable. This means that at the very moment when we become powerful enough to affect the most basic conditions of our lives, we have to accept that we are just another animal species on a small planet. A new way to relate to our environs is thus necessary once we realize this. No longer a heroic worker expressing his, her creative potentials and drawing from the inexhaustible resources from his or her environs, but a much more modest agent collaborating with his, her environs, permanently negotiating a tolerable level of safety and stability. And is the very model of ignoring the collateral damage not capitalism? What matters in capitalist reproduction is the self-enhancing circulation focused on profit. And the collateral damage done to the environs, not included into costs of production, is in principle ignored. Even the attempts to take, to take it into account through taxation and so on, or by way of directly putting a price tag on every natural resource one uses, including air, cannot but misfire. Because, you know, there is a wonderful, but it's crazy, I think, unworkable capitalist attempt to deal with ecological crisis. The idea is it's a crazy one of total commodification. Like, somehow we should calculate, for example, our entire air supply, air on, uh, on Earth. How much is it worth? Is it worth? Let's say, I don't know how many trillions, and then somehow divide it and add to the price. There is even an attempt in this way, some feminists were for it when I was young, to solve the problem of exploiting women by putting a price tag of unpaid homework of women. Now this sounds nice, there is a certain justice in it, but I don't think it works. It's simply what it seems to be, a total commodification. Uh, so, in order to establish this new, ah, another thing uh, I want to add here is that uh, for this reason, I don't think that the right way to criticize capitalism is to accuse it of being uh, egotist, short-sighted, and so on. Walter Benjamin was right. Capital a true capitalist is possessed by a certain perverted ethics. Capital should turn around even if we all drop dead and so on. Maybe what we need to be good ecologists is precisely a little bit more of commonplace egotism. Like, you know, don't be just obsessed with reproduction of capital, think about how our lives will turn out and so on and so on. So in order to establish this new mode of relating to our environs, Sloterdijk claims a radical political and economic change is necessary. What Sloterdijk calls the domestication of the wild animal culture. 
His thesis is the following one, very simple one, but I think convincing. Till now, each culture disciplined, educated its own members and guaranteed civil peace among them in the guise of state power. But the relationship between different cultures and states was permanently under the shadow of potential war, with each state of peace nothing more than a temporary armistice. As Hegel conceptualized it, the entire ethics of a state culminates in the highest act of heroism, the readiness to sacrifice one's life for one's nation state, which means that the wild barbarian relations between states serve as the foundation of the ethical life within a state. Hegel, again, develops this nicely, how for him, in our ordinary lives, we just care about uh, ordinary daily business, profit, happy family life, and so on. And we forget about, about our basic universal ethical vocation. That's why for Hegel, to simplify it somehow, war is necessary. To remind you that you are not just uh, the utilitarian egotist whose activity is here to bring pleasure, satisfaction, whatever. You have a universal ethical duty. Uh, I simplify Hegel, of course, it's more complicated. But uh, so in, uh, in today's, is today's North Korea, with its ruthless pursuit of nuclear weapons and rockets, uh, to hit with them distant targets, not the ultimate example of this logic of unconditional nation-state sovereignty. However, the moment we fully accept the fact that we live on a spaceship Earth, the task that urgently imposes itself is that of civilizing civilizations themselves, of imposing some kind of universal solidarity and cooperation among all human communities, a task rendered all the more difficult by the ongoing rise of sectarian religious and ethnic heroic violence and readiness to sacrifice oneself and the world maybe for one's specific cause. So it's a very simple vision, but let us make a step back and reflect upon what Sloterdijk is advocating. The measures that he proposes as necessary for the survival of humanity the overcoming of capitalist expansionism, wide international cooperation and solidarity that should also be able to transform themselves into an executive power ready to violate state sovereignty, and so on and so on. Are they not all measures destined to protect our natural and cultural commons? If they do not point towards communism, if they are not, if they don't imply a communist horizon, then the term communism has no meaning at all. Once I asked about this Sloterdijk, and then he squeezed out, you know, he said, I just wouldn't call it communism, but communalism or whatever, and so on. <laughs> no, but what I like, you see, this is how honest conservatives think. He, although he is terrified at communist crimes, he is well aware that the unbridled logic of capitalist reproduction and of state sovereignty, that is to say, all this logic of ethical sacrifice for one's country as the highest act has to be abandoned, left behind. So again, although Sloterdijk critically rejects the 20th century extremism and passion of the real, the shift he advocates is extremely radical much more extreme than the standard communist vision of a new society which continues to rely on the capitalist unconstrained expansion. No wonder Sloterdijk remains vague about how to enact this immense transformation. A closer approach would necessarily bring him to the old topic of communist reorganization of society. So to resolve this deadlock, because again, when it comes to positive measures, I ask him, Peter Sloterdijk, but how would you do this? He remains vague, we don't know, and so on. Uh, uh, we should follow the good old Marxist path and shift the focus from politics, in the sense of how, should, how can we be active politically, what to do, to the science of post-capitalism, 
that are discernible within global capitalism itself. Especially the rise of what? People like Jeremiah Rifkin, Paul Mason and others, and I'm far from fully agreeing with them. But nonetheless, they did detect what they call collaborative commons, a new mode of production and exchange which leaves behind private property and market exchange. One could thus conceive collaborative commons as the return at a higher level of the gift exchange ancient societies. In collaborative commons, individuals are giving their products free into circulation. This emancipatory dimension of collaborative commons should, of course, be located into the context of the rise of so-called Internet of Things, combined with another result of today's development of productive forces, the explosive rise of what Rifkin calls zero marginal costs. More and more products, not only informations, can be reproduced for no additional cost. What lurks behind Internet of Things is, of course, a properly metaphysical vision of the emergence of the so-called singularity. Our individual lives will be totally embedded in a divine-like digital other, which will control and regulate them. This extrapolation confronts us clearly with the utter ambiguity of the Internet of Things. Two mutually exclusive readings of Internet of Things impose themselves. Internet of Things as the domain of radical emancipation, a unique chance of combining freedom and collaboration where, to paraphrase Juliet's definition of love from Shakespeare, Romeo, the more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite, versus Internet of Things as complete submersion into the divine digital other where I am deprived of my freedom of agency. How should we relate these two aspects? It's what I find so fascinating. Now, in Germany, they are publishing the manuscripts, thousands of them, of what we cannot, from hindsight, we can call Soviet Bolshevik tech gnosis. It's so interesting to see how all the records while bullshit and so on. Oh, you find it in Bolshevism in the 1920s. You know, the predominant ideology, not just some marginal, marginal crazy guys, but among hundreds of thousands of intellectuals, even Trotsky sus subscribed to this vision, was that with new developments of technology, the era of individual, in, individual human beings who regulate their lives through emotions, fears, and so on, is over, that literally the ultimate task of communism is to construct a new man, which will be immediately part of a collective, and at the same time not immersed into his, her bodily existence. For example, they use this Im image of sexuality. The, uh, it's an incredible movement. I mean, we totally forgot about it. The, and uh, the idea is the following one, that uh, now that the working class has power, capitalism is over uh, in the Soviet Union, the state power is in the hand of workers, blah, blah, the last fortress of the reaction is sexuality. Why? They claim because in sexuality you have this dependence on, dependence of, on feelings at its purest. You know, like, sorry to be vulgar from my male chauvinist position, you see a beautiful naked woman, uh, you are like, you know, you are directly affected. Their idea is, I mean, maybe. Well, uh, at my age, it gets problematic, and so on. <laughs> what, what they claim, what they claim, these uh, Soviet Gnostics, is that in communism, even the most intimate sexual impulses, arousals, and so on, should function like, how do you call those, uh, up, those uh, screens on a machine? You know, like, for example, when you control a heating machine. The point is not, or 
a machine which functions. You don't have to feel if it is hot or enough. You look at the temperature display. And the idea is that in developed communism, our bodies will function in the same way. That even if you will feel something, you will not be immediately affected by it. It would be like, am I hungry? Let's look at the screen. Do I need sex? Let's look at the screen. And this is, it's, the theological background of this is extraordinary. It is a theological background of French uh, post jansenism Cartesian thought. For example, my favorite post-Cartesian philosopher, Nicolas Malbranche, have this, developed this idea. For him, there was sex. They screwed like crazy, Adam and Eve, in paradise. But his point is, they did it just as another instrumental activity. Getting erection was like raising the hand. Making love was like working on the field, you know. It was simple instrumental activity. You were not directly identified by it. And she, Malbranche, I found this beautiful, even identified in this weird term, the fall. The fall was when Adam thought, lost this distance. When he thought he is directly affected by objects. And in a nice anti-feminist twist for Malbranche, uh, the object which seduced Adam into this empiricist mistake, I am immediately affected by object, was of course the body of naked Eve, you know. Then, it's a wonderful crazy theory of Malbranche that uh, God punished us for this. How? God saw how we humans wanted to abandon this divine distance. We are not our bodies. Uh, and he said, now I will punish you by, since you want to control your body as a machine from a distance. So I will give you, to he meant, of course, God was the male chauvinist here, man, uh, that uh, I will give you, I will make it so that part of your body will be uncontrollable in its movements, erection. <laughs> you will not control it. It will happen when you don't want it, when you want it desperately, it will not happen, and so on. <laughs> and you know, you find this theory already in St. Augustine. It's a theory that the uncontrollability of erection is the divine punishment for, for the sin. And I mean, it's absolutely closer to know this line of thought, like, um, in Silicon Valley, they should return to their communist roots, hopefully, you know, in a much more primitive way technologically. But nonetheless, how this dream of digital immortality and so on, in a primitive way, everything was already there formulated in Soviet Gnosticism. And you know what's the saddest thing in it? That Stalin put an end to it. The Stalinist Cultural Revolution in the late 20s was precisely, with all its horrors, a return to, let's call it, normal human life. No, this is why Stalin imposed socialist realism, a move which was very popular at that point. The idea was what? People hated all that futurist, constructivist, avant-garde bullshit, you know, uh, Malevich, Eisenstein. They wanted normal, warm stories, sentimental, and so on. Stalin, uh, Stalin gave all this to them. Now we are returning to it. What I want to say is, again, I want to focus on this ambiguity of Internet of Things, which is the final prospect of this, uh, 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 this di total digitalization of our lives. Uh, what is happening is uh, with Internet of Things, it's what? Things can also refer to a wide variety of devices such as heart monitoring implants, biochip transponders on farm animals, electric uh, cl clams in coastal waters, automobiles with built-in sensors, DNA analysis devices for environmental uh, monitoring and so on. These devices collect useful data with the help of various technologies and then autonomously flow the data between uh, to other devices 
So human individuals, that's also a crucial part of Internet of Things. So human individuals are also things whose states and activities are continuously registered, transmitted without their knowledge. Uh, you know who developed this in a very naive way? But uh, you learn things from that book. It's a best-selling book now, Yuval Harari, Homo Deus. Again, I don't buy his conclusions, but he provides a nice description of this process. How? I refer here to Harari's book. Our self is composed of narratives which retroactively try to impose some consistency on the pandemonium of our experiences, obliterating experiences and memories which disturb these narratives. That's our everyday experience. We don't remember everything. We are censored by ideological mechanisms, not in any uh, 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 mysterious, totalitarian way, but simply we try to make sense of our experiences and we try to organize them automatically into narratives. Uh, uh, so ideology does not reside primarily in stories invented by those in power to deceive others. It resides in stories invented by subjects to comfortably deceive themselves. But the pandemonium persists. And now comes the wonderful confusion of, sorry, uh, 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 description by Harari of the consequences of Internet of Things. Uh, imagine a near future, right, in our society where all our acts are monitored by machines. It's easy to imagine. You go to the toilet, you don't even have to think about it. Your urine is analyzed. Soon we will have chips implanted controlling our health, Amazon Cobb uh, uh, and Kindle. You know, what is controlled there? I was so surprised to learn even. Uh, you know that Kindle controls not only what books you buy, but how much you read them, which pages you read, and so on and so on. So the machine monitoring you, what you shop, what you read, what you watch on TV, in a way, knows you better than yourselves. It knows the raw data bypassing the narratives that you construct about yourself. The machine registers the discords and can maybe even enable you to deal with them in a much more rational way than your conscious self. Say, when I have to decide to marry or not, the machine will register all the shifting attitudes that haunt me, the past pains and disappointments that I prefer to swipe after the carpet. And do you know that they already made, I spoke with some of friends of mine from Israel who did uh, wide research, they did something very vicious. They got the permission from a couple of couples who were planned to be married to be monitored from some time. And then they compared the decision of the couple to get married or not. They compared this, their conscious decision, to the conclusion of the computer. The conclusion of the computer was much more accurate. Like, if they did marry, the computer predicted this marriage will not last and vice versa and so on. Why not? It was also demonstrated by experiment. Uh, why not? Uh, extend this prospect to political decisions. While myself can be easily seduced by a populist uh, uh, demagoguery, the machine will take note of all your past frustrations. It will register the inconsistency between your fleeting passions and your other opinions. For example, you know, in the trial of the moment before elections, you make a crazy decision. It's proven, and it's not even a reactionary conclusion, that, for example, I'll put it like this, instead of you stupid Americans being allowed to vote freely, and then you get what you get. A crazy guy married to a Slovene girl. Melania is Slovene, and you know that in Slovene we exploit it. We already have Melania cake, Melanie wine, and so on. We're doing big business of it. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine did a wonderful experiment and 
demonstrated that if a computer were to be allowed, just some machinery collecting all the data, to follow your life, all your past decisions, sympathies, and so on, and rationally conclude what are your actual interests and advise you how to vote, Trump would, would never have been elected, you know. Okay, I violated my promise that I didn't <laughs> mention uh, the word Trump and so on, but what can we do? So, uh, ag ag again, uh, uh, why should machines not vote on our, uh, on our behalf? Now, you will say this is a crazy dream. No, but uh, uh, computer scientists here are much more rational. They are not claiming machines are perfect. They are just modestly claiming that on average they are much better than your conscious decision. <laughs> but you, you know, they are not totalitarian in the sense of uh, imposing on you. They don't define for you what is good for you. They accept your own version of what you want, happy life, whatever. And they just measure, do you in your decision Live, live up to your values. And they tell you better than you yourself know what to follow. It's the same with medicine. Although we need doctors, but it's clear that even if machines can make a mistake, on average, if you allow a machine to diagnose you, it will do on average, I repeat it, a better job than, than, uh, than an average uh, doctor. So, of course, the conclusions of this, if you go to the end, are, are sad. The uh, de decisions made by human individuals are much weaker, less rational than the decisions made, if you allow them to be made, the, ma the decisions made by machines. So, uh, uh, as I quote from this uh, Yuval Harari, this problematizes the notion of liberal individual who, that's the basic premise, knows best what is good for him. I quote from Harari, liberalism sanctifies the narrating self and allows it to vote in the polling stations, in the supermarket and in the marriage market. For centuries this made good sense because though the narrating self believes in all kinds of fictions and fantasies, no alternative system knew me better. Yet once we have a system that really knows me better than I know myself, it will be foolhardy to leave authority in the hands of the narrating self. Liberal habits, such as democratic elections, will become obsolete because Google will be able to represent even your own political opinions better than yourself." End of quote. Now, one can make a realist case for this option. I, it is not what the computer which registers uh, my activity, it's not that computer is omnipotent and infallible. It's just that, on average, its decisions work substantially better than the decisions of our, the decisions of our mind. So, the digital machine is maybe the latest embodiment of the big other the subject supposed to know, which operates as a field of knowledge, a chain of signifiers without a master signifier, an, a non-subjective machine. And uh, the problem is then, what will happen in this growing digitalization? Will, there are two options. Will we uh, be a uh, Will there be what Ray Kurzweil calls singularity in the sense that our minds will combine together into a higher unity or whatever, which will nonetheless control this process? Or will we be, how should I put it, uh, dominated, by the, uh, dominated by the machines? I think that, uh, I think that, uh, uh, the, the true problem here is that I think there is no simple answer to this, uh, to this question. Namely, again, the question is this one, who will control it? Will we be nonetheless our collective mind? 
masters of this process or will be as individuals just reduced to cogs in a machine and so on and so on. I believe here in Stalin's answer, I mean, of course, uh, one of the best jokes that I know from Stalinism, you know. It's a wonderful joke, I'm sorry if you know it, I used it once already in my books, where the joke goes like this. In 35, in Politburo, Soviet Union, they had the debate, will there be money in communism or not? Right-wing deviationists claimed there will be money, of course, money is natural, how can you exchange objects without money? Left-wing revisionists claimed, uh, left-wingers claimed, no, money is capitalist tool of exploitation, there will not be money. Then Comrade Stalin enters the debate and says, these are both deviations, right-wing deviation, left-wing deviation. The truth is the dialectical unity of both. There will be money and there will not be money. Now, nobody understands Stalin, that's the Comrade Stalin, can you explain how can this be? And now comes the genius. Stalin says, it's very simple. Some people will have money, other people <laughs> will, will not have money, you know. And that should be answer. Will we control it or not? Well, some will control it, others will not control it. I think that, I more and more believe that one version of our future is, uh, something is happening today. Uh, futurologists call it the decoupling of intelligence from consciousness. So more and more digital mechanisms, computers will regulate our lives. But I think for a long period at least uh, uh, there will be a privileged class which will have a privileged access programming these computers and so on and so on. And so the reason I'm a communist, I'm claiming, listen, I'm just following Hollywood, I mean, I basically claim that all these dystopias of, you know, like Hunger Games, uh, 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 Elysium, and so on, they paint a very realist, okay, it's exaggerated, but not a very <laughs> realist vision of what is awaiting us. So, uh, so there are many other things to say to hear philosophically. If you had the misfortune to read all those books on Singularity by Ray Kurzweil, <laughs> you know what's the problem with him, a serious one. He, he cheats. He describes this singularity, we are all one mind, but the way he writes, he still writes as if we will somehow retain our free self, we will be reasoning, talking, having emotions, and so on and so on. That's the usual mistake of, let's call them, uh, let's call them pessimist, uh, sorry, optimist futurologists. <laughs> they paint a bright future, but they forget to mention the price, that literally personal freedom disappears in this singularity and so on. Uh, uh, the other uh, uh, negative dystopian vision, we will be just cogs in the machine and so on, is, I think, also wrong, because to put it in Lacanian terms, it is too theological, in the sense that it trusts too much into the coherence, consistency of the machine. I don't fear computers because they will see everything and so on. I think computers can go crazy, they are always inconsistent and so on and so on, and that's why subjectivity will persist. But let me go on so that I don't lose time. Uh, now I want to make a surprising jump from this vision of Internet of Things. And you saw, I hope, I don't have time to go into it in detail, this ambiguity of the vision. How? On the one hand, if you read Rifkin and Paul Mason, it's almost as if, oh my God, communism is almost here. You know, Internet of Things, no longer private property and so on. But I think this merry communist vision of Internet of Things with no private property and the pessimist vision of we are all controlled are two sides of the same. You cannot have one without the other. Here I would like to do something now to move to a more philosophical topic that may surprise you. Uh, I think that there is another way to approach Internet of Things. Uh, they are maybe theoretically my enemies, but you know, I'm a Leninist. I always say, let's learn from our enemies, you know. Like, 
although I'm opponent of what is called new materialism. But I was nonetheless fascinated by uh, Jane Bennett's famous description of how actants interact at a polluted trash site. How not only humans, but also the rotting trash, worms, insects, abandoned machines, chemical poisons, and so on, each play their never purely passive role. This, this, uh, this idea that we shouldn't oppose just human actants and passive trash, but this idea of, how should we put it in precise terms, of stepping out, of course not fully, but at a certain level, out of our human skin, as it were, and observe, analyze social processes as at this more zero ontological level, where we are just one among the actants. This is, I think, the best approach which somehow brings us close to how things function in the so-called Internet of Things. Uh, and I think that uh, the ethical implication of such a stance is that we should recognize our entanglement within larger assemblages. We should become more sensitive to the demands of this, to the, to the demands of other objects, uh, and we should reformulate self-interest. All this is clear. But uh, now I agree, and I don't mean this in any way as an obscenity or critique of it, but the truly subversive act would have been, I'm sorry for the tastelessness, but that's my point. For example, to give a Jane Bennett description of Auschwitz, not just humans, but human, trash, gas ovens, and so on, how this functions as an assemblage, and so on. There is something inhuman in it. Maybe in order for our survival, we need to look at things like this. Not that we sacrifice humans, but to see us as one among the agents and how, and then how all of it functions. Because this is what is, in a way, impossible prohibited. What do I mean by this? Uh, uh, I was always fascinated by this idea that the real, what Immanuel Kant calls, think in itself. It's not so much some mystery out there that we can... It's something that simply we are prohibited to see in order to retain our common identity, meaning of life, and so on and so on. Here, although I am not one of the great fans of Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, I deeply agree with what he wrote at some point. He said, let's say that we would discover, by some miracle, reels, movie, uh, cinema, reels, of some Nazi officer who shot in detail the process of, in gas chambers, or the Muslim and the living dead, and so on, all the horrors. He says, I would have burned those reels immediately. You know, it's simply that our reality, life we live, cannot sustain that. There are things that we, and imagine, okay, this is your American trauma, but imagine something similar, like imagine, and my paranoia is that maybe Homeland Security has them, they just don't want to release them. September 11. There must have been some guys there who were recording what happened when the Twin Towers were collapsing and so on. You know, there is a certain domain that has to remain unseen for us to, to for our lives to remain meaningful. And my point is that maybe to survive, we have to break out of this phantasmatic horizon of our lives and we have to learn to look at ourselves, as it were, from outside, as one among objects. There is nothing mysterious in it. It's not the same as looking at things from a divine perspective, and so on and so on. It's still the way we humans see ourselves as among the object. But we have to perform what a Russian formalist called astranenie, estrangement, you know, this radical, a subjective 
view, which is possible, and not only possible, but necessary. And now I came to my basic point. I don't believe in this homo deus hypothesis. If this universe will emerge, I think that it's not that we enter a post-human era where we will be like gods, you know, those who will be in. I claim that God will be the first victim of it, whatever we mean by God. And, but now comes the paradox. Although I'm a materialist, I am a Christian or religious materialist, I think that there is a certain religious experience, and don't be afraid, I'm not a new age bullshitter. It's not that <laughs> in some sense you feel the unity of all and so on, you know. But that uh, there is, at an elementary level, a religious experience which will have to survive even in this universe. What kind of? Now, if you allow me, I'm now checking myself. Oh, I'm not doing too bad. It should go. Yeah, I still have just a quarter. Now comes the cinematic example. I want to, this is now a very dark part, but it's central. Please be patient for another 20 minutes. Uh, I'm referring to a wonderful Danish noir film from 2016. Now, I can be arrested for saying this, but you can download a very good copy on Pirate Bay or whatever. <laughs> it's, uh, it's called A Conspiracy of Fate. The original title is uh, Flask and Post, Message in a Bottle. Uh, it's directed by Hans Peter Molland. Uh, at the, towards the end of the film, I will not yet, uh, wait a second, that, that, and then you will press the button, yeah. there is a, a conversation, a remarkable dialogue between Karl Mork, a burnt out, terminally depressed detective, and, and a guy called Johannes, a handsome blonde serial killer of children, who is as interested in destroying their parents' fate as in snatching their offering. The final confrontation takes place in a lone sea cottage where Johannes, the bad guy, holds in chain as prisoners Mork, the inspector, and two children kidnapped, a young boy and his sister, a girl. And we have there totally devastated the detective, desperate. The murderer, Johannes, presents himself as one of devil's sons whose task is to destroy faith. And he tells Mork, and now I'll take your faith away. Now, let's go through this three minutes and then I will just conclude, please. And uh, I will maybe, to put it in what you said, um, subtract myself from the image so that you can see. Let's hope it will work. I pray this is always the moment of anxiety, like... <laughs> will it work? I and hope so. Yeah. There should be some type... Ah, we have the sound. There are some type... That's the... Possibly your hands. Sitting down. Not important. He's just remembering how he killed his mother. How I just want to burn you. Now, you see, death. Father, them, Tom. Father, they're shielding him. This has nothing to do with children. I understand that it can be like this, but it has not. I have found the purest way to obtain his end goal. Done with it. We will win over God. I take faith from those who believe. First, from the children. Fra foreldrene, familien, alle mister sin tro, og så sprer det seg. Og nå... Og nå... Nå skal jeg ta troen fra deg også. Du spiller din tid. Jeg tror ikke på Gud. Jeg tror ikke på en skid. Nu 
Johannes. Johannes. Nein, 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 Jeg har aldri møtt noen menneske i hele mitt liv som tror så mye som deg. Johannes. Johannes. Det er bare en lille dreng. Han har ikke gjort noe. Ja? Ja, han er jo bare en liten gutt. Så hvorfor er det ingen som hjelper han? Tøm meg i stedet for. Johannes, tøm meg i stedet for. Johannes! Tøm meg i stedet for. Tøm meg! Nei, 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 nei. Johannes. Johannes! Johannes! Se meg! Skulle du ønske at Gud fylte deg med en sånn kraft at du kunne stoppe meg? Jeg tror at du kommer til å huske denne dagen, Karl. Få meg. Få meg. At du var her. Og at det ikke forandret noe. Og Gud kom aldri. Hennes, hør. Hennes. Hør, du skal ikke gøre det her. Tag mig i stedet. Nå tar du denne. Hennes. Nå tar du høvn. Så blir du hans, så blir du fri. Unfortunately, the movie makes a little bit of a compromise here. The heli <laughs> no, what I mean is the, the helicopter sound that you heard is the police coming and uh, they even discover then that the, the boy is not really dead. They save him and so on. Uh, uh, I'm more brutal here, I mean. I was deeply disappointed by this, no? But uh, again, let me provide you, and with this I will end the, the reading of this. We should, of course, dismiss as ridiculous Johannes' idea of acting as the devil's son, an idea which is meaningful only within the standard theological universe. If we follow T.S. Eliot's insight that devil's ultimate temptation is the reference to good itself, as he put it, Il Eliot, in his Murder in the Cathedral, the highest form of treason, to do the right deed for the wrong reason. Then it is Mark himself, I think that's the irony, who is the true devil's son. You know, like, he acts with faith precisely as non-believer. And 
I'm not yet sure, but through some friends in Denmark, I got a contact with the director of this film. And like just through my friends, I did not really ask him, is this the underlying idea? That, uh, forget about this stupid, pseudo beautiful, blonde Nazi guy. Mork is really devil's son. He said, yes, this was the idea. So, devil's ultimate trump card, also in the sense of, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, is not give way to your lust for power, enjoy life, abandon the chimera of higher ethical values, but do all the noble deeds your heart tells you to do, live the highest ethical life, and be aware that there is no need for the reference to God in all this. It is your own inner nature which is your guide here. You are following the law of your heart. Is this stance not personified in Mork's atheist readiness to sacrifice himself for God? I think it's not as simple as that. That would have been the simple humanism. No, we don't need God, even if we don't believe. No, I think uh, Mork's position is much more radical. In what sense? Uh, first, the lesson of his position, the detective Mork, is that only a belief which survives a disappearance of God as the big other, ultimate authority, is believed at its most radical. It's a wager much more crazy than Pascal's. You know, Pascal's wager. If you don't believe, act as if you believe and belief will come. Uh, uh, remains epistemological, concerning only our attitude towards God. We have to assume that God exists. Our wager doesn't concern God himself. While for radical atheism, the wager is ontological. The atheist subject engages itself in a political, artistic, and so on project, believes in it without relying on any guarantee. So my thesis is that only that in Christianity, that Christianity is the only consequent atheism. In what sense? Let me refer here to, I think this, po the point I'm trying to make was best made by the French materialist so-called, he wasn't really a materialist, Denis Diderot. In a short manuscript he uh, called Entretien d'un philosophe avec la marchale, uh, 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 a certain lady, he wrote, he concludes, after all, the most straightforward way is to behave as if the old guy God exists, even if one doesn't believe it. Now, my comment. This may appear to amount to the same as Pascal's wager apropos, apropos our ethical acting. Even if you don't believe in God, act as if you believe. However, the Dross point is exactly the opposite one. The only way to be truly moral is to act morally without regard to God's existence. In other words, Diderot directly turns around Pascal's wager in the advice to put your bets on the existence of God. Another quote. In a word, it is that, beautiful formulation, it is that the majority of those who deny uh, uh, renumerating and revenging God have all to lose and nothing to gain. End of quote. So, in his denial of vengeful God, the atheist either loses everything, I mean, if he is wrong and then there is a vengeful God, haha, he will be punished, no? Uh, there is no God, so nothing. Or he gains nothing, in the best case. If there is no God, then who cares? It is this attitude, I think, which expresses a true confidence in one's belief and makes one do good deeds without regard to divine reward of, of, or punishment. It's again as if the old guy exists. This old guy is God the Father, which recalls Lacan's formula, le père ou pire, father or worse. In true ethics, one acts from the position of the inexistence of the big other. Again, here we should bear in mind that this movie 
is a Danish movie. And of course, Kierkegaard is always in the background. The, the detective Mork, no, it's clear in the film already, is, this is officially declared in the film, is suffers a terminal depression. And I claim this terminal depression is precisely the form of what Kierkegaard called infinite resignation, the crucial step towards the authentic religious experience. For Kierkegaard, the renunciation, the sacrificial renunciation, cannot be part of an exchange with God. We sacrifice all, all the totality of our life for nothing. Quote from Kierkegaard, listen, the contradiction which arrests our understanding of God is that a man is required to make the greatest possible sacrifice to dedicate his whole life as a sacrifice and wherefore there is indeed no wherefore, end of quote. What this means is that there is no guarantee that our sacrifice will be rewarded, that it will be, that it will restitute meaning to our life. One has to make a leap of faith which in the eyes of an external observer cannot but appear as an act of madness. Another quote from Kierkegaard. At first glance, the understanding ascertains that this is madness. The understanding asks, what's in it for me? The answer is nothing, end of quote. When in the movement of infinite resignation, I turn away from all temporal goods, then, I quote here Simone Weil, my reason for turning away from them is that I judge them to be false by comparison with the idea of the good. And what is this good? I have no idea. End of quote. Uh, at this razor's edge, where atheism and theology overlap, we get a unique form of negative theology. Which, uh, this form of negative theology was wonderfully defined by Rowan Williams, you know, the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury, who, quite surprisingly, is one of the miracles, is a very intelligent theoretician also, uh, who wrote about the work of four British, when he tries to develop in his book on Dostoevsky, uh, Rowan Williams, what is a religious experience at its minimum? He refers to four British Catholic novelists, O'Connor, Percy, Spark, and Ellis, and here is the passage. All four create a world in which the secular majority account of what is going on is severely relativized. But there is no simple alternative that anyone can step into by a single decision or even a series of decisions. The religious dimension of these fictions lies in the insistent sense of incongruity, unmistakable even if no one within the fiction can say what we should be congruent with." End of quote. So you see, it's a very simple operation, but I think deeply true. What's the point of Rowan Williams here? And incidentally, you should read his book on Dostoevsky. It's so intelligent. For example, he put it into words, what was my old feeling? <coughs> <coughs> that there is something terribly wrong with Dostoevsky's idiot, Prince Mishkin. She gives a wonderful counterintuitive reading. You know, usually people read idiot as a saintly figure, this innocent goodness. For Rowan Williams, he is nightmare itself. As he develops, Mishkin is saintly, innocent guy, but you must have encountered them. I have in real life. There are people who are in themselves saintly, good, innocent. But in every society they move, their innocence brings havoc, catastrophe. People around them kill themselves and so on. And this is precisely what happens in the idiot. All in Nastasia Filipovna, the other, all people uh, die around and so on. So let me go on. Uh, Ron Williams. Uh, speaks here about a kind of negative theology, which is the opposite of the usual negative theology, which is, oh, God is beyond, it, it is, it's not, it's good, it's bad, it's beyond our categories. No. Uh, 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 Williams's idea is that, at its most basic, 
God is just this negativity incongruity. This reality cannot be all. We don't fully belong into it. But there is no other place. First we get this void, this out of jointness, if we call it like this. And uh, this we experience in a shattering metaphysical experience. This out of jointness in this uh, precisely when we assume what Kierkegaard calls uh, radical, called radical resignation. We resign, but not on behalf of some higher value, and so on, and so on. And if religion doesn't forget about this, then it is really no longer the opium of the people. Because I claim that, you know, this unfortunate formula of Marx, religion is the opium of the people. I have uh, two problems with it. Uh, first, two, both tautological variations. I love it. First, as many people already remarked, today in our drug-infested culture, more and more the opium of the people is opium itself. You know? <laughs> and the second one, the Donald Trump version, sorry, I mentioned it three times, it, him three times. No, I wanted to say I mentioned it three times. I don't consider the term he for him. Uh, uh, as Adorno said somewhere wonderfully, in populism, the opium of the people are people themselves. People themselves can also be the opium. So, again, uh, I claim that uh, this, if we, you take everything away, no transcendence and so on, this negative theological minimum, this out of jointness, and we have different names for it, Freud called this, uh, uh, called this death drive and so on. This minimum remains. That's why I take this film in a uh, naive metaphysical statement that you've heard very literally. The evil guy Johannes was right. It's precisely because he, Mark the detective, is totally resigned, doesn't believe in anything, that he can do a pure ethical act that he believes more than, more than anyone else. What he does, acting automatically, ethically, but out of this total resignation, this is religious ethics at its purest. And in our desperate times, where effectively, you know, all conservative calls, return to ancient values, and so on and so on, are ridiculous, don't work. We need this type of religion, maybe what Mark is doing. It's literally an atheist religion, but again, not in this shitty sense, oh, although I don't believe in personal God, I have this mystical experience of some higher. No, 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 you must have total, total resignation. Here I'm totally opposed to those, even many of my materialist friends, who claim, of course, I'm against a personal God, I'm even against a church as an institution, but I have some time this deeper feeling and so on, and I usually explode back. I say, no, what interests me in religion, it was already the case with Freud and Catholic Church, is forget about God. I like church as a dogmatic institution, you know. <laughs> because again, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go on, but I think this is how ethically we can even resolve the dilemma of what if science proves that we do not have free will. My, I would like to apply to this the paradox of Protestantism, you know, predestination. Isn't it, you know the story, I repeated it often enough, isn't the paradox of predestination that capitalism, the most dynamic system in the history of humanity, pushing to act all the time, relies on predestination. Everything is predestined. Wouldn't it be more natural to say that Catholicism should be more appropriate. That, that, that Catholicism is the idea that your salvation depends on your good deeds. Then I have to work hard to deserve it. No. Why does Protestantism push us to be active all the time when you know that everything is already decided? Why should we not say everything is already decided, so fuck off. I will drink beer, masturbate, and watch movies, you know? No. Ah, the idea is, of course, what's the catch. Everything is decided but you don't know what this decision is. So for me, the, pure, the purest situation of freedom is not 
this primitive choice, like I go to a, sorry, my old vulgar example, I go to a bakery, uh, they have marzipan cake, strawberry cake, chocolate cake, which should, no, the purest anxiety of freedom would be something like this. I know I am in a position to make a tough decision, do this or that. I know it's already predestined, but I don't know what it is. And this terrible pressure, you know, will I guess what is already predestined? <laughs> it doesn't help me to, to say whatever. No, you, it's a terrible anxiety. That's freedom at its purest, existentially. So even if at the level of objective facts, you can say it's predestined, whatever, but subjectively, knowing that it's predestined makes your decision where you have to enact what is predestined, but you don't know even more an aspect of anxiety. So uh, I claim that that's my not even optimist vision, that this minimum of atheist religious experience will have to be mobilized if we want to find our way in what is forthcoming it's effectively, I think today, you know the famous quote from Virginia Woolf on the 10th of October of 1914 or what, human nature change, or I got the wrong date. I think today human nature is really changing. Because you know what human nature is, it's most elementary. This distance inside, outside, like uh, reality is out there, I think, inside. But what's happening now are crazy things, like more and more it's possible to wire our brain so that you think about something and it happens. Like recently I learned that even Stephen Hawking no longer needs his stupid finger. His brain is already wired and he, they can already do this at an elementary level. Stephen Hawking just has to, has to think forward and his wheelchair moves forward. I think the consequences of this will be tremendous. And uh, all old ethical norms fail at this level. And again, that's why I think that the worst thing to do is to simply rely on, oh, it's determinism, we are not free, so let's take it easy. No. Precisely when we know that we are determined but not know how, why we will be confronted by freedom at its purest. That's why I sincerely believe that the more our universe will get computerized, technicized, and so on, the more we will need a religious experience, but not in this bullshitting way, you know. The technological universe is empty, so we need something to fill it in. That's what Catholics are doing, no? or the popes and so on serially, like technology itself is not enough, you need a deeper vision and so on and so on. No, no, I'm talking about religious reference in a much more radical, this almost to say like this atheist way. And I have some allies, I liked it, it was crazy. You remember, was it reported also in your media what Pope said a month ago that uh, 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 that uh, an open atheist is much better than a hypocritical Christian, and so on and so on. Totally new alliances have to, be, have to be constructed here. What I don't agree with, and this is where, although in some way what they are saying is true, all these today, let's call them official ideological materialists, talking and so on. Uh, I'm not saying they are too radical. I'm simply saying they are not radical enough in the sense that the most intelligent critique of them that I read is that although they claim, you know, free will is illusion, materialism, and so on, but they enter deeply into what one can call a pragmatic contradiction. But they still act reason as if they are free beings and so on. They cheat in this standard uh, uh, the technological agnostic way. And this is a big problem, properly Lacanian problem. Uh, what kind of subject fits modern science, to put it very simply? If you accept 
consequences of science to the end. Okay, the obvious answer would have been the position of somebody like Paul and Patricia Churchill, you know. We have to accept, we have no free will and so on. I claim this position doesn't work because it's existentially impossible. Uh, impossible in the sense that I agree here with my favorite uh, uh, cognitive scientist, I quote him in my old books, Thomas Metzinger, who claims that uh, you cannot subjectively assume as your truth the fact that you are just a neuronal mechanism and so on. You can know this rationally, but you cannot subjectivize it. Okay, Metzinger is a Buddhist and he tries to prove, it's an interesting attempt, that at the level of most radical Buddhist meditation, when you reach the level of what they call thoughts without a thinker, that you can do it. Then the standard predominant position is the position of dualism. Like most cognitivists claim, okay, we just have to accept this as our necessary limitation. We can develop it scientifically, that we are just neuronal automata, but we will never be able to subjectively assume it. We as they claim, our free will and so on is a user's illusion. We have to have it. Then we have, as I already mentioned, the church and theory, which is we can assume it. We become more open, more tolerant. Uh, no, I think that even the Buddhist way, although it's the most intelligent, Metzinger's, it's too easy. That there is a subject which fits this radical technological objectivization, and it's precisely this. Kierkegaardian resignation, subject of uh, radical resignation, uh, subject of, in my sense, negative theology. I'm sorry if I was too confused at the end, but this is my line of thought, and if some of you, to make a little bit of propaganda, are interested in it, I uh, developed the first draft of this, but it's totally new stuff that I presented here. I begin going onto this path in my last book, uh, last philosophical book, Disparities, where there is a long chapter with a consciously vicious title, Is God in existence, stupid, evil, or, or virtual, or whatever, no? And I try to develop there this, this notion of God, personal God, as a necessary illusion, but not in this bad sense of for stupid people and so on. If I may conclude with this to make it a little bit easier, I tell there, maybe you know it, I'm sorry, uh, it was told to me by my good friend Jean-Pierre Dupuy, uh, a certain pseudo-ancient anecdote, it's not clear where is the origin. Nicholas Luhmann uses it, Dupuy uses it. Of, okay, one of the subtitles in my book is entitled The Twelfth Camel as one of the names of the God, you know. And I, this is what fascinates me. It's a pseudo, I think. It didn't really happen there. It was invented in Europe. I'm not sure. Maybe it is from there. Uh, le the legend, Arab one, goes like this. There was an old merchant who was dying, and he left his legacy to his sons were 11 camels. And he made his will. He says to his sons, older, elder son, middle, the younger son, that they have to divide his legacy so that the older son gets half of it, the, uh, the next son gets, I, I think, one-third and then one-fourth or whatever of it. Uh, but there was a problem, you know, like, you, what is half of 11? Because the father insisted the division must work exactly, otherwise you get nothing. Okay. The sons ask a wise old guy who said, no problem, I will solve the, it. He says, I will give you a present, another camel. And then they tell him, but why should you lose a camel? He tells them, don't worry, you will not, I will get it back. Let's, now we have 12 camels, you know, and let's divide it. Half of 12 is six. The elder guy gets six camels. Uh, one third of 12 is... Uh, no, sorry, it should be one, uh, 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 twelve, one, uh, yes, uh, one, no, the other guy gets, yes, uh, the, 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 now I'm confused. 
the, the next guy gets one fourth, one fourth is three, and the last guy gets, uh, gets, uh, gets one sixth or whatever of 12, which is two. So six, three, two. We divided it precisely the way father ordered. Count it. Six and three and two is what? Eleven. And so now I take my camel back. <laughs> and it worked. And the idea of Dupuy is that this is God. You know, you have to, it's the twelfth camel. To make the operation, to make it function, you have to count it in. It's in this way, but not in this derogatory way, we need an illusion to survive. It's more a, it's more a structural necessity. In that it's not simply we can think without him. If you, it's this wonderful paradox of an illusion, which if you, it's an illusion, but if you erase it, you lose also the reality of which it is the illusion. Okay, I spoke too much. I'm sorry if I, you were disappointed, but don't be, <laughs> to make another propaganda. I, uh, in two months, a new book of mine, Courage of Hopelessness, will be out, where you will get all the dirty stuff, LGBT, Trump, and you will be <laughs> able to lynch me again, and so on, you know. Okay. I just wanted to do a little bit more, not really difficult philosophy, but like, okay, thanks very much. I appreciate your <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You know why I love Ken? He asked me now with care, can we do it? Are you too tired? Ten minutes? And I love this. I love being too long. <laughs> because then I, I, I hypocritically, I can say, oh, I would love to engage in a long debate with you, but unfortunately we don't have time and so on. No. So well, let's play democracy We have now. ten minutes. <laughs> and raise your hands high so I can see them. You made a good decision. Yes. You began on the left. That's right. Always on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, Mark Fisher writes. Sorry. Mark Fisher writes that people would rather imagine in, in, in a ap apocalyptic event rather than an end to capitalism. It is, it's so nice, sorry to interrupt you immediately, I will give you a word, that you mentioned here Mark Fisher because I also was Fred Jameson plagiarizing him, because I know this as a quote from Fred Jameson. Okay, sorry, go on. Yeah. Yes. That, that people would rather imagine the end of the world than an end to capitalism, yeah. and that in that sense that they miss the big other, as, as Lacan put it. Sorry, in that sense? In that sense that they miss the big other. And, and that, that seems to be a way of blocking our way to transcendence. What, what do you think of the, of the implications of capitalism always being like how Deleuze put it? And no, you know why? I, I'm not saying that I like capitalism, but more and more I'm convinced I will shock you <laughs> with this that, you know, uh, my friend who is, is he here? Todd McGowan. He no, he's not. He's not. Traitor. Okay, that's for, <laughs> for police. To, that he developed in his book Capitalism and Desire. And a similar line of thought is now pursued by another of my friends, Aaron Schuster. That there is some truth, of course, not the literal one. In the idea that, this is linked with your question, that capitalism is in a way the natural system. It's not just one. You know in what sense? For Lacan. Desire, human desire is characterized by this constitutive instability, no supreme good, constant hystericization, you never get it. And as it was clear for Marx already, in this sense, capitalism is not just one among the systems. It's a system which directly brings out the paradox of human desire, which was here all the time, but the previous ideologies tried to contain it. You know, the idea of supreme good is, no, we are not in this permanent hysterization. There is a stable ultimate value and so on, God, whatever. And uh, so uh, that's why it's really so difficult now to step out of capitalism at its most fundamental. Capitalism is, and it was always clear with Marx, 
That's why it is so powerful. It is the point of truth where, you know, it's that something which was covered up in all previous history comes out here. As, which is why also, as Marx makes it clear, capitalism is the first system based on instability. It's permanently unstable. And this brings us to all these paradoxes. The more capitalism is in crisis, the better it functions, you know. That's why Marxists, and I still consider myself one, get into all these problems. Like, you know, already for Lenin, imperialism was last late stage of capitalism. Then, what was fascism? Mao Zedong says, American imperialism is the last rotting phase of the late phase. Now we have, <laughs> an, you know, like, this idea of la late capitalism, it gets more late and more late, and the more it is late, the better it is doing. Now it finally triumphs. This is, for me, a mega tragedy that, uh, that today, I spoke once briefly with Fukuyama, and I told him he laughed. I told him, maybe even you are right, capitalism triumphed. But what about the fact that today the best managers of capitalism seem to be ex-communists where they are still in power? <laughs> <laughs> in China, in, uh, they are, uh, in, in Vietnam, they are doing well as uh, managers of capitalism. So what I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that it's not just the power of ideology. We cannot imagine the end. It is really difficult to imagine how to move beyond. In a way, this is the truth, the problem of the left for me. And that's why I did that crazy, sorry, I will break, you can lynch me. Trump, Trump, I will make it again. That's why I don't like this idea of just mocking Trump and focusing on Trump. Trump is for me a symptom, not in any deep sense, but in Trump it exploded what didn't function in predominant liberal ideology. All this dissatisfaction, that's why I like Bernie, because Bernie Sanders was the only one who did try to capture this new dissatisfaction. And what I'm saying is that the only way to really get rid of Donald Trump is to change this liberal consensus to push it to the left. I mean, our task is now terrible of the new left. We have, to, we have to save what is worth saving in liberalism. So what I'm saying is that uh, there is a real crisis in, of okay, imagination. How to imagine the end of capitalism? How will it work? Isn't it the madness that I see today, which makes me really sad, is that this total reversal of roles, like in Europe, you know, which is the only government which did some pro-working class measures that even the most radical European social democrats would prefer to do is the disgustingly conservative nationalist government in Poland. You know what they did now? And it's the same in France. Le Pen promises much. So we are living crazy times where only this racist anti-immigrant right is ready to risk some uh, measures which are usually associated with the left, like in Poland, they lowered the age of retirement, more uh, health care, cheaper, bet better, better, uh, 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 better scholarship for students. On the other hand, this was, I think, a genius of modern European bureaucracy. If you want to do the most brutal austerity politics, you need a radical leftist so-called power to do it. This is the Greek tragedy. You know, and that's why, incidentally, concerning Greece, I'm against both. That is to say, I think that I don't agree with those Grexit people who thought we should have gone out. No, that would have been a total catastrophe, hunger in Greece, and so on. They wanted European bureaucracy. They wanted uh, Grexit. And they have already a plan what to do. Varoufakis, my good friend, was explaining to me. You know, this is a central... Some leftists behave as if, oh, Greek government capitulated to Europe, we should have risked Grexit. Yeah, but uh, you know what would have meant? You know what Varoufakis told me, and it's now confirmed uh, through some other politicians that I met. When Varoufakis spoke with uh, Schäuble, the German finance minister, and told him as a threat, oh, if you put this pressure on us, we do Grexit. 
Israel they told him, fine, how much money do you need? We can give you 20, 30 billions and so on. Because uh, the, uh, what was subversive was, although I doubt how it was, of course I'm also against Tsipras capitulation. But what Varoufakis desperately tried was to remain within Europe and cause a chaos havoc there. To force your and maybe there was a chance in, in that one. But, def, but if you just capitulate what Tsipras did, or you, if you just go out, it is catastrophe. Because as everyone, pre, many people predicted, Greece is now even worse where it was a couple of years ago. No, well, uh, now it's the same city situation, it's just that the national debt is instead of 180, I don't know, it's approaching 400 billion or whatever, you know. No, sorry, but uh, I'm just saying, okay, I, didn't, I will stop, that <laughs> it's not just that because of ideology we don't see it, you know. Uh, the best proof how difficult it is to imagine alternative to capitalism is Fred Jameson himself. He ended up proposing, you know, in that text that shocked everyone, uh, militarization, that the army should take over. This is the ultimate paradox. I just see the real problem behind it. Now, not you, you are probably a leftist like me, but some liberal would tell me, why even bother? Why don't we remain what I ironically like to call leftist Fukuyama, you know? We accept the Fukuyama liberal democracy capitalism, we just push it a little bit to the left. Uh, here I'm a pessimist. I think it will not work. At the level of ecology, refugees, uh, uh, biogenetics, uh, financial capital, intellectual property, it will not work. Even Sloterdijk is here right. And that's the tragedy today. We will have to invent something, which is why incidentally I think that we should drop that unfortunate pseudo-orthodox Marxist metaphoric or of, uh, you know, train of history, we know where history goes. Recently I was rereading some text of French Jacobin revolutionaries and Saint-Just says something wonderful. Saint-Just says we revolutionaries don't have any higher necessity to rely on, we are just captains. Uh, 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 leading a ship in the middle of a storm, entering an uncharted territory. It's a much better metaphor. There is no guarantee, no higher necessity, and so on. But at the same time, I claim if we don't do, if we just resign and say, let it go on, well, then Hollywood will win. Our society will be like, uh, like Hunger Games and <laughs> Elysium. It's already get him there. I know I didn't answer your question, but it's in my nature. <laughs> it's in my nature. We have time. Can we take a selfie? Sorry? We have. After can we take a selfie? On one condition, that you don't show it to me. Oh. Because I think <laughs> I'm such a disgusting person with all my nervous tics that I cannot stand any image of me. Yeah, yeah. We have time for one more question. Ah, now you go to Safe Water Center. No, opportunist, opportunist. Okay, sorry. Okay, we can make two, to be honest, and I will cut short my answers. Okay, so what, two brief questions, you can answer them together? No, uh, the questions can be long, my answers will be brief. <laughs> you know, I try, I will be a wise guy, this is a joke. What if I give you these pseudo deep zen answers? Clap with one hand, listen to silence, and so on. That bullshit always works. Please, please, you decide who. Oh, this is the cheapest political correctness. This is the cheapest political correctness, you know. It's like that stupid reproach to La La Land, you know. There are many gays in LA. Why don't, why is not, why are not there some gays in the, sorry, yeah. My question is about this. Uh, uh, you have to speak into the microphone. Yeah. My question Loud. is about. Uh, loudly. Okay. Louder. Uh, is about the um, uh, condition of the new subjectivity that you are talking about. Yeah. Um, because I think that very moment is going to move beyond the cognitive con condition, right? Because it moved beyond thinking. Because first you said that um, uh, the, the pure idea of freedom is that anxiety of yeah. choosing, okay, this one or that one uh, in the condition that we know it's pre uh, this thing, yeah. right? But uh, let's say that subject is that in the movie, that guy that he says, kill me, right, instead yeah. of the other person. 
I think in order to make that choice, you have to move beyond the process, the very condition of thinking. Because thinking why do you think this? Because, Please explain. Because 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 I'm here with Alain but you. I don't want to drop thinking. Okay. The, the reason the reason is that because thinking and logic tell you choose yourself over the kid. If 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 you are in a normal condition. Mm -hmm and not why? in a certain why? condition. Why, you don't why does thinking be tell you that? Beca because I don't get it. I'm very naive. I'm not criticizing you even. I just try. Why? Uh, I you presuppose the thinking is automatically. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Unless, unless you're, you have a very specific notion of thinking that moves beyond the uh, uh, Kantian notion of thinking, right? Unless you're, you're de redefining the definition of thinking itself. Because thinking is cognition. Right? Unless you're saying that thinking is not. We philosophers like to complicate things here, you know. For Kant already, thinking is not the same as cognition. Cognition is cognition of phenomenal reality and so on. Thinking, you know, cognition is scientific objective cognition. Thinking preci precisely moves beyond it. And Kant's point is not simply that Kant's point is precisely that okay. pure condition. So, sorry. so still we are, we are moving beyond cognition. But yeah. it still is at the level of thinking. Yeah. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank no, but you. I uh, okay. I would okay. Then I would just uh, I agree with you that we have to move beyond cognition. Mm -hmm. I would just that's not problem. accept that this is beyond thinking. You know, thinking is uh, a very mysterious thing. Like this is why I here remain some kind of a humanist, not naive humanist, and claim that uh, you know, uh, uh, like. What can computers do? They can do many things. They can do uh, imitate cognitive aspects and so on and so on. I doubt that they can think, at least now, in the strict sense. Because thinking is, for me, something much more intricate. I think that, first, and it's already clear with Kant, the origin of thinking is always a failure. The ultimate act of thinking is that you uh, try to account for your failure. Where does thinking for Kant emerge? Why for Kant, for example, thinking is not condition? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, cognition. Because cognition means I try to get knowledge of objects and so on. When you think, you see that there are no mena, that cognition cannot cover everything, and so on and so on. So, OK, then we clarify it. If we change words, we, but you know what bothers me? when you said out of thinking, because what I want to avoid at any price is any of this mystical experience bullshit, you know. So yeah, yeah, that's exactly. my fear, but you know. Yeah, but I think that in some sense, even truth is beyond condition. And I don't mean, again, any uh, gnostic truth I or whatever. I like, I, I said to briefly explain it, the example that I always use, but I'm also for Palestinians, for everyone. Of That's my standard example, anti-Semitism in Germany. Let's say, I'm, I'm sorry if I use this old example, they repeatedly use it. Let's say we are in Germany in mid-30s, I engage in a debate with a hard-line Nazi about the Jews. The moment I, we debate about it in terms of cognition of Jews, like, we try to convince each other that what I claim about Jews is wrong, I sold my soul to the devil. Why? Because, for example, my, not friend, evil guy, says Jews are evil because they are seducing German girls. Well, what can I answer? I hope they did, and I hope the other <laughs> way around it worked. Of course, they said Jews are exploiting Germans. Well, up to a point, this was in a vulgar sense true. Not all Jews. This is often neglected. There were also poor Jews in Germany, but many Jews were rich. They said there were too many lawyers and journalists. Jews controlled the press. Well, at the level of facts, in a moderate way, this was true. It's true that 40% of lawyers in but, but you know what we have to see? That anti-Semitism, we should not combat it by reality in the sense it's not true what you are telling about the Jews. Because if you are truly anti-Semitic, this doesn't help. Like, once I had long years ago a debate with Ernesto Laclau, who claimed there is a dissonance between 
anti-Semitic notion of the Jew, radical evil, and his example, what, what is a German anti-Semite? Has as a neighbor a good old Jewish couple, kind people. Will this not give ri uh, rise to some doubt in him? Like, all my bullshit Jews are evil, but wait a minute. These two Jews living in my... No, if you are truly anti-Semitic, you know what you do. You tell yourself, that's why the Jews are so dangerous. They appear to be kind and so on to come. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you always find the way. The true question to be raised is not, are Jews really like that? But why does a Nazi need the figure of the Jews to, uh, to engage in his project? I'm just uh, 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 developing a variation of, you must know it, of this classic point of Lacan. He puts it in a wonderfully naive way. I'm sorry again for making chauvinist bias. But Lacan put it like this. He says, let's say a husband is but, uh, uh, jealous of his wife that she's sleeping around with other men. And Lacan's beautiful point is, even if all the suspicions of the husband are true, his jealousy is still pathological. Because, you know, the point is not, does she really sleep around? The point is why the husband is so fixated on it. And this is not cognition. This is truth, you turn back, you enter another dimension. But sorry, I'm losing too much time. Let's do, now you got it. Um. Thanks very much for your Facebook. And uh, I, was I was a little bit afraid that there will not be enough jokes and so on. And I'm very glad that you saw. So next time when I come here, why don't we move even higher? Yes and do some pure thinking, because, you know, I also have another book in print now. Uh, it's an obscene title, Incontinence of the Void. <laughs> ah, it's, it's, it's Beckett, you know, in his, uh, uh, in his well said, well thought. Right. There is a dying old lady, and he mentions the term, incontinent void, and so on. It's pure metaphysics, that book. Okay. That's what I love. Thanks, that, thanks very much. Okay. Oh, we did this perfect, we survived.